We saw a cow's head with horns. I said, it's a slaughterhouse. The building that Sounds Antiques in used to be a dairy. They used to milk cows in it. It was imperfect. It was a place that was a fertile ground. Something about Sound Techniques, I just, the feel of the place was just kind of cool. People now have a very different attitude to recording than anybody did then. Those were the days of taking more risks. Maybe. Neither John nor I were particularly enamoured with the recording consoles being made in England. We didn't have any money, so it was a simple choice. I had to make my own. The sound that came out the other end, wonderful. How do you get that sound? That's the thing about music. It is unexplainable. They put those records on and go, whoa, what are those guys up to? Hey, it's Tim with the University of Vinyl. That was um, a portion of a clip from a little teaser for an upcoming documentary that I've really been looking forward to. Uh, it seems to be taking forever. I don't know if it's a pandemic thing or what, but I think this thing has been in development since 2014 on um, a legendary studio in London called Sound Techniques. Uh, it was in the Chelsea neighborhood and it's really kind of known as um, the headquarters of that mystical British folk fusion rock jazz music that, that started coming out in the very late 1960s into the early 1970s. This is the studio where Nick Drake recorded all three of his incredible albums. Um, Joe Boyd was... Uh, one of the producers was a producer on all three of the uh, Nick Drake albums. And he, uh, along with the co-founders of Studio Techniques, um, really kind of worked as a unit and got several of these artists to record in this really unique studio. It, it was in an old dairy barn. Before I go further, <laughs> Um, I guess, you know, that's kind of the intro here. I'm, I'm going to do another video um, about Legendary Studios. I haven't done one of these in a while. And kind of what spurred me on today for this was rediscovering the Brighter Later album by Nick Drake and kind of digging a little bit further into that. I also recently listened to uh, a podcast again from 99% Invisible um, called Three Albums Till Sunset. And it's all about Nick Drake's career. It is, it's an incredible podcast. Highly recommended. I'm going to drop a link down below. Today I'm going to be talking about that kind of mystical British traditional folk jazz rock uh, that is so exemplified in three key albums I'm gonna to highlight today. And in between that, we're gonna have a little fun with some, uh, some video footage, um, some historical footage, and also maybe a couple other bits and bops from that upcoming documentary on sound techniques in Chelsea, London. <laughs> going to talk about British folk rock, um, we would be amiss if we didn't talk about Fairport Convention. And um, I have the 1969 album Liege and Leaf, which is an incredible piece of work. You know, Fairport Convention, um, they were kind of working along the same time period as the band in the United States, although Fairport um, were really steeped in traditional British and, uh, folk songs and folk standards. And they kind of made them their own, particularly on this incredible album. Uh, Fairport Convention, of course, were at that point in time um, the great Richard Thompson on guitar, Simon Nickel on guitar, Sandy Denny, uh, a great, great historical voice in rock and folk music was on lead vocals. Um, we had Dave Maddox on drums. This was the first album uh, that Dave 
uh, appeared on uh, with Fairboard Convention. Uh, Dave Maddox, uh, if you're an XTC fan, you'll remember uh, that he eventually showed up and uh, did all of the drumming on Nonsuch, an incredible XTC album. Um, this was recorded uh, at Sound Techniques, of course. Uh, if we look at some of the credits on this album, um, familiar things are going to pop up. Engineered by John Wood, who was one of the founders of Sound Techniques. Uh, produced by Joe Boyd uh, for Witch Season Productions. That was Joe Boyd's uh, early production house. Remember, Joe Boyd um, came very, very close to being the career shepherd for Pink Floyd. He was one of the people who was an early supporter of Pink Floyd, and he actually had Arnold Lane, their first single, that actually preceded this album. Um, interestingly enough, there's hardly any footage of uh, sound techniques, any recording sessions or anything like that. There is, however, a performance by Pink Floyd uh, doing Interstellar Overdrive uh, in the main floor, the main studio, live room at uh, Studio Techniques. So a little sidelight history there. Dave Swarbrick was on violin on this album to great effect. Uh, that is kind of an old-timey feel on the cover. Um, this, of course, was a gatefold album. Um, and the gatefold artwork is quite interesting. They have all of this kind of traditional British kind of vignettes of different things happening and little historical tidbits. That's really interesting. Um, as far as songs on this album... Um, Come All Ye uh, is the lead track. That is um, an original song, actually, um, from Denny and Hutchins. Um, then we have a traditional arrangement, um, 55 Ray Nardine. Uh, Maddie Groves is a traditional arrangement. Um, but this is great, 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 rich music. And... Um, I think it belongs in everyone's collection if they're really interested in in folk rock uh, because British folk rock is, is really, really incredible. And, you know, Led Zeppelin III, uh, when Page and Plant decided to kind of mix up the sound from just a pure electric blues, uh, they moved into more of a pastoral theme or themes, um, heavy folk tinged, and and um, some of that inspiration, of course, came from came from this particular album. Jeff Ross and John Wood had been working at another studio in London, and they were concerned uh, that there was going to be some downsizing in the industry, so they wanted to kind of strike out on their own, and their dream was to have their own their own recording studio. Jeff Ross took a trip to Nashville and he wanted to take a look at some of the recording studios in Nashville because remember in London they were getting these incredible records from Nashville. Um, you know when Nashville started doing, uh, started moving from just pure country and western in you know bridging over into folk and into rock um, couple studios in Nashville were famous for uh, their their kind of singular sound that they had there and Jeff Ross wanted to find out what exactly how what was going on in Nashville what did the studios look like and he went there and basically introduced himself um, and and kind of kicked the tires on two or three very historical studios um, chiefly the Bradley Studios uh, on, on Music Row in Nashville. Uh, that, that is where uh, Dylan did a lot of recording, Simon and Garfunkel, etc. What Jeff Frost saw in Nashville was a real revelation for him. You know, he had come from 
the old school English studios. Uh, one good example is Abbey Road, EMI's Abbey Road at the time. Um, and, and, you know, the old studios in London were epitomized by, you know, white coat lab technicians walking around with tons of um, room effects and sound effects that had been installed on the walls, the ceiling, to tamp down uh, the sound. Now, in Nashville, it was totally different. There was hardly any uh, acoustical effects other than maybe some separation uh, panels put in between instruments, but it was very much a live sound, and the sound that emanated from these rooms kind of had its own signature. Um, so when Frost and John Wood found a location in an old dairy uh, barn uh, where they actually used to milk cows in old, old town, old town, old city London, um, they basically did a minimal amount of uh, remodeling. They put in some new double glazed windows in the, in the place. Um, they did a very uh, limited amount of room treatment. They actually laid down a very thin layer of concrete under new uh, uh, carpeting uh, in the main live room just to kind of do a little bit of deadening of sound uh, there um, to cut back on leakage. And uh, that was about it. And then they, they actually were able to kind of raise on the second floor of this old building. Uh, they were actually able to remove a portion of uh, the ceiling and um, then they had a, a really nice high ceilinged room, perfect uh, acoustics, and a really interesting laid back signature sound emerged uh, from this studio. The neighborhood at that time um, in, in Chelsea was just kind of bucolic and ideal. Uh, the, you know, here they are setting up shop in an old dairy cow milking situation, milking uh, building. And right across was a very nice traditional English pub. Uh, down the street was uh, kind of a deli serving cold cut sandwiches. Uh, everything that <laughs> a struggling musician uh, would need was basically uh, a few footsteps outside the front door of this new recording studio. Another great artist um, that kind of exemplified this early British folk fusion um, and more on the fusion angle for this next artist because he actually had quite a few jazz elements as well. Uh, I'm talking about John Martin and this of course is the 1971 album Bless the Weather. It was recorded in its entirety uh, at Sound Techniques uh, for Witch Season Productions, which is Joe Boyd's um, production house at the time. And wow, what, what an incredible, unique guitarist John Martin was. And um, this is an original early UK pressing on that island uh, label with the pink rim. Um, this is a recent pickup um, from Absolute Vinyl uh, in Longmont, Colorado. Again, one of my favorite stores. I've talked about it before. Um, but this thing is in near mint condition. Great, great, great record. Uh, I am just kind of scratching the surface on John Martin, starting to get into him. But this is, uh, this is, wow, this is really, really... Bless the weather, John Martin recorded at Sound Techniques in London. Thank you. 
If you think of all the music that was recorded at Santo Nix, I mean, some of that music is extraordinary. I, I hate the fact that it's, it's not there anymore. You know, that really kills me. I, I, w I wish I, I could just go down there and, and sit in on a session or, or, or book it and, and make a record there. I mean, it'd just be so wonderful because it was a great space and it, it was, it was um, a place where the music sounded better after it was recorded uh, somehow. It had that, uh, that magic to it. Last but not least, the incredible Nick Drake. Nick Drake, as I mentioned earlier, recorded all three of his his albums. Uh, he actually returned to uh, Sound Techniques in 1974 before his untimely death. Um, I think he recorded four or five more songs that eventually would end up on uh, a couple of comps, I believe. Um, but but uh, that was the last recording that he ever did at Sound Techniques. Um, this guy was just an incredible artist. And I actually have the, I think this is the 2013 reissue of the Brighter Later album. Um, the Back to Black, it's a European pressing. Um, they totally replicated that textured cover. I don't know if you could see that. Let's take this out, actually. Gorgeous, gorgeous cover. You can kind of see that, that, that uh, textured cover. Um, there is the back cover of the album. Um, kind of an interesting photograph there of Drake on the back. Um, interestingly enough, there is no known footage of Nick Drake performing. He was incredibly shy. Um, did not, you know, all of his albums basically failed commercially. Hardly sold anything at the time um, because he just could not go out and support the album um, in a live setting. And um, so from Fairport Convention, they brought in Dave Maddox on drums, uh, John Cale from the Velvet Underground, of course, did some of the arranging uh, of this album. Uh, also um, appears on at least one track. Yeah, Kale played viola on the fantastic song Fly on side two. Um, who else do we have? Uh, we have uh, Richard Thompson backing him up on guitar, of course. Um, and then uh, Nick Drake, all, all vocals and all uh, um, acoustic guitar. Um, this master tape recording apparently has been lost to the sands of time. Uh, there are different dubbed uh, tape copies and digital formats that have been used for various reissues. Um, not having known what a, a, an original pressing sounds like, I, I will say this sounds excellent to my ears. Uh, they've even reproduced the old uh, inner sleeve, uh, the old UK inner sleeve, quite quite interesting. Uh, the music on this album is incredible. It is, uh, you know, the first two albums, Drake had a full accompaniment backup uh, um, with the songs and they were fully arranged. Uh, only on Pink Moon uh, was it fully acoustic with just him and his guitar. Um, but even uh, on, uh, on Brighter Later, there's some outstanding string uh, sections that are on different songs, uh, and they all crowded into that tiny um, studio techniques, or sound, uh, sound technique studio, which just kind of makes it quaint, just knowing that there was probably a teapot <laughs> Uh, going uh, a kettle on and um, you know if probably a, you can imagine people walking out across to the pub uh, which is still there it's a different name uh, for a quick pint or maybe somebody needed a sandwich down the street um, it just conjures up you know great visions um, of, of a, 
of a great period uh, in London. One of my favorite cities in the world. Favorite songs on this album. Almost, there's not a bad song on the album. It goes from an interesting mood of, uh, of an uplifting, happy, happy feel to somewhat melancholy uh, at times. Uh, it's it's a great mix of music. Um, at the chime of a city clock and one of these things first. Incredible, incredible songs. Uh, side two, stand out for me is Northern Sky and Fly. Uh, but you can put this on and time just kind of stands still and and the music the, the music is breathtaking. Uh, and Nick, Dro Nick Drake had a unique voice, and he was a fantastic guitar player. That is uh, Brighter Later, Nick Drake, the second album, 1971 it was released. It was recorded uh, over a few weeks in 1970 at Sound Techniques in London. At the end of 1974, um, the owners of the building in which the, the, the Sound Technique studio had been constructed um, were looking to sell the property outright. They were looking for a, 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 a buyer, and John Wood and Craig Frost could not come up with the 120,000 pounds uh, at that time. Unbelievable. Who knows how much that little building is worth today. Um, so the studio actually uh, was purchased by Olympic Studios and it was used as a recording studio, I believe, for about another five or six years up until uh, maybe 1981, 1982, at which point it was sold and it became, uh, it was remodeled, um, studio was deconstructed basically. And they are now, uh, from what I can understand, they're uh, executive flats. Uh, or they were executive flats at the time. They're probably uh, broken up into two or three individual properties uh, at this point in time, knowing property in London. Um, anyway, so that is, uh, that is a wrap on Sound Techniques Studio in London. Uh, an incredible 10-year period in time. Historical albums were produced that just typify British folk uh, at that point in time in the late 1960s, moving into the 1970s. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you would um, consider subscribing. I will um, really appreciate that. appreciate your support, as always. And uh, if you do subscribe, you'll be notified any time I put up a new video. I do a couple of these, maybe three times a week, depending on scheduling. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, we will be back soon.